around here uh, yesterday, you know, about the afternoon, the folks, even in the uh, newsroom there, were turning, were turning on to. The folks here is another day, so I just remind you to please turn off all your cell phones. Right. We have to make because some people <laughs> will play with their cell phones. <laughs> you can figure a way to make them work, we'll all be glad to put them on. All right. I will give the mic over to Kristen. So you go start. Okay, thank you. Okay, I can. See Brigadier General Votel. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Pentagon Briefing Room. I'm Colonel Keck, the Director of the Press Office, and I'm glad to have you here today. It's my uh, privilege to introduce you to our briefer today, who is Brigadier General Joseph Votel, the Deputy Commanding General for Operations of the 82nd Airborne Division and Combined Joint Task Force 82 in Afghanistan. He's been in country since January, and General Votel and his forces are responsible for operations in the NATO's Regional Command East, as well as overall responsibility for all operation and during freedom operations in Afghanistan. And General Hotel is going to provide us with a comprehensive view of the security, reconstruction, and development operations in Afghanistan. He is speaking to us from Bagram and north of Kabul. And with that, General Votel, I'd like to turn it over to you for opening comments. Okay, thank you very much. Well, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, from Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan. Uh, as, uh, as Colonel Keck mentioned, I'm Brigadier General Joe Votel, the Deputy Commanding General for Operations uh, for Combined Joint Task Force 82 and Regional Command East here. Uh, this morning, what I'd like to do is begin with a brief introduction to our mission and our ongoing activities here in Afghanistan, uh, and then I will uh, answer any of your questions. Uh, as many of you already know, the 82nd Airborne Division replaced the headquarters of the 10th Mountain Division in early February here, in, uh, here at Bagram Airfield and assumed uh, responsibility as the ISAF, NATO ISAF Regional Command East and the Combined Joint Task Force 82 for uh, all OEF forces. Our mission here is, is, uh, is, is fairly simple, and it is this. In conjunction with the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, our joint interagency and multinational uh, partners, CJTF-82, conducts full-spectrum operations to neutralize insurgent forces in Regional Command East, develops Afghanistan national security capability, and supports the growth of governance and development in order to build a stable Afghanistan. Our current operation is called Okab Hamkari, which is Dari for Eagle Teamwork. It began on February 22nd to build on the success of Operation Mountain Eagle by the 10th Mountain Division. This operation is being executed in conjunction with our clear, hold, build counterinsurgency strategy. In the clear phase, uh, we are focusing on separating insurgents from the population. This requires the Afghan National Security Forces participation at all levels to kill or capture the enemy and disrupt his command and control capability. To this end, we are conducting military operations uh, in the interior of the country and along the border uh, area with Pakistan. In the hold phase, we assist in establishing the Afghan government as a permanent presence with effective integration and positioning of Afghan national security forces at the provincial and district level. And finally, in the build phase, we begin to leverage the investments uh, in development and expand government capabilities uh, into these provincial and district areas. As I mentioned, we're partnering in this operation with the Afghan National Security Forces that include the Army, the police, and the Border Police. And we conduct combined planning and combined execution with these forces. This partnership is absolutely critical to the success of our operations and to developing the capacity of the Afghan National Security Forces. Our combined forces live, plan, and work together to execute their mission. We coordinate routinely with our counterparts in Pakistan and hold regular meetings to ensure cooperation throughout the border area. Operation Hamkari is not solely centered on the kinetic fight. While security is certainly a large part of it, combat operations are not the only measure of effectiveness. 
The other key elements to our overall success are building the Afghan National Security Force capability, extending the reach and influence of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's government, and uh, development projects uh, in, the, in the provinces. We are working very closely with the U.S. Agency for International Development and other national and international non-governmental organizations to ensure our military operations are quickly followed by reconstruction and development activities that extend the reach and influence of the district, provincial, and national governments. In this fiscal year, Regional Command East has invested over $125 million uh, using the Commander's Emergency Response Program, or SERP, and I'll talk with you about some, uh, some of those projects in a moment. Our top development efforts are focused on provincial coordination centers, district coordination centers, the development and capacity building within the Afghan National Security Forces, roads, agriculture, agriculture, border security, education, and health care. I'd like to give you some examples of our progress over the past few months. What we've been focused on is realigning and establishing partnerships with both the Afghan National Police and the Afghan Border Police. We have not previously worked with, uh, with these entities uh, to a great extent, but we clearly recognize uh, the need to do that now as they expand their capacity. We've identified, selected, and began training of the first Afghan uh, Army commando units uh, that, will, uh, that will be uh, operational later this summer. We continue to train the Afghan National Army to conduct unilateral operations, and in many cases, uh, they, uh, they take the lead in both planning and execution. We've discovered and exploited dozens of caches of weapons, ammunition, and improvised explosive devices. Uh, we've worked with uh, the local uh, Afghan civilians and discovered literally dozens of IEDs uh, throughout our area. And we've recently completed uh, a rule of law surveys throughout all the provinces uh, and most of the districts to understand what their needs are in these particular areas. Uh, these all fall generally into the uh, area of security. Some of our biggest achievements, however, have been in development. Let me cite a few examples for you. Uh, over the last uh, two and a half months, we've uh, pursued 14 different agricultural projects, uh, ranging all the way from providing seeds and tractors and trees to providing veterinary care for uh, farmers and their flocks. Uh, we pursued over 60 educational projects, building schools, uh, both uh, uh, brick and mortar and tent schools, uh, providing books and other school supplies <clears throat> so that school could start on time uh, here about three weeks ago. We pursued about 20 electricity projects, in particular micro hydro power plants, uh, solar lights and generators to provide uh, electricity and power down into the villages. We've worked over 40, mil uh, 40 health care projects, equipping hospitals, clinics, providing training, ambulances, and medical supplies. Water is a key aspect uh, here in Afghanistan, and as a result, we've, uh, we've worked 25 irrigation projects, repairing dams, water systems, flood walls, and canals. Over 95 urgent humanitarian or reconstruction projects, providing emergency food supplies, clothes, tents, tarps, and toolkits. Over a dozen civic and cultural repair projects, uh, ranging from renovating women's centers uh, to mosques to parks. Over 30 governance and rule of law projects, creating provincial and district centers, postal centers, and public works buildings. Nearly 65 transportation projects, roads, bridges, retaining walls. 40 water and sanitation projects, wells and repairs of dams. All of these projects were funded by the Commander's Emergency Response Program that I referred to early, earlier and are coordinated with the local government officials and our non-governmental organizations. And they represent priorities not for us, but priorities for the Afghan people. We believe we are making a difference, and together with our NATO coalition and Afghan partners, uh, we are bringing positive change to Afghanistan. Uh, I would be happy at this time to take any of your questions. Right then, uh, remind you that uh, General Votel cannot see you, so please uh, identify yourself and your news organization. Go ahead, Pauline. Sir, it's Pauline Jelinek of the Associated Press. You mentioned uh, that you found dozens of weapons caches, and yesterday General Pace uh, said that weapons from Iran have been now found in Afghanistan. Can you, from what you have in your area, shed any more light on that, the numbers of times you've seen such a thing, when, what kinds of things they are? 
Well, I think uh, I think the reports that uh, that General Pace uh, discussed yesterday uh, were a result of some cache finds and some weapons and other material finds uh, that uh, that were picked up down in Regional Command South, uh, the area to our south. So I don't know all the particulars of that uh, of that. Uh, uh, of those fines, uh, we are obviously aware of it, and as a result, uh, we 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 will continue to look as hard as we can at everything we find. I think it's important to, to recognize that uh, whenever we do do military operations and we do find caches or or weapons or other things that we uh, we uh, try to exploit those, we try to figure out where they've come from. And if we're not sure, we have the uh, we have the means and methods to evacuate those uh, those pieces back to. Uh, back to the laboratories and other places back in the United States where further analysis uh, can be done. And, sir, the things that you have found, what, did the, what are the sources? Where do you think they've come from in your area? Well, I think uh, they can. St I, I think they come from a variety of locations. Obviously, uh, there are uh, some of these weapons are, are, are of all kinds of different makes. Obviously, the most common thing we see with uh, uh, with uh, insurgents here as AK-47 type weapons, RPGs that all uh, emanated throughout the former Soviet bloc countries uh, and uh, as, as you probably are well aware are populated in literally dozens and dozens of countries around the world. So it, it's difficult for us to trace where they are all coming from. Uh, there certainly are some markings uh, that can be uh, uh, in indicative of where they've come from. Uh, what our what our job to do is 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 to get those caches, get them under control. If something looks suspicious, then we try to get it back into uh, back into the right channel so they can exploit and determine where those uh, where those weapons have come from. Sir, this is Pam Hess with United Press International. Could you talk to us about the border area and what you're seeing? How much traffic comes across there? How much of that is Taliban or insurgent? And what the status is of the the tribes in that region who were who said that they would be you know cracking down on it and uh, for the Pakistani government so that there didn't have to be Pakistani forces or U.S. forces going in there. Have you seen results from that, or is there something else that needs to be going on there? Well, uh, thanks for that question. We see uh, ebbs and flows of, uh, of activity along the border, and literally every day uh, at places along the border, we have some, some level of contact, uh, albeit uh, relatively small in most cases with, uh, with some insurgents or, or, uh, or other personnel along the, along the border. Uh, our, our approach here has been to, has been to uh, work very, very closely with the uh, Pakistan military. Uh, and I would just tell you, I think there's three main things that I would try to emphasize to you that we are doing. First of all, uh, the most important thing in the border area is communication. And so we have, uh, we have worked very hard over the last couple of months to ensure that our tactical headquarters uh, on, on the Afghan side of the border and the, and the Pakistan tactical headquarters on their side of the border can talk and communicate freely. And I, and I will tell you, we have seen significant progress in that communication chain across there. The second thing that we are trying to do is, is engender cooperation along the border. You are probably aware that, uh, that the border area is, is, uh, is largely tribal. Uh, extensive Pashtun tribes uh, that operate in that area have for generations uh, and uh, reserve the right to move freely back and forth across. So it is very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to know exact, the exact numbers of how many people move back and forth across. Uh, the border area. It probably ranges in the thousands every day uh, throughout the entire uh, almost 570-mile uh, border that we have in Regional Command East here with, uh, with Pakistan. But what we try to do is uh, we try to identify those likely infiltration routes, work with, uh, work with the Pak uh, Pakistan military, and then position our forces so that we have control over those areas and we minimize uh, the disruption. And then the final thing is, is cooperation. Uh, I've already mentioned the communications aspect of this. Uh, there are certainly a variety of, of things that, uh, that take place in the border area. So uh, what we try to do is make sure that the Pakistan military is, is aware of the uh, operations that we are conducting on our side of the border. And likewise, we are aware of the things that they are doing on their side of the border. Recently, we've, uh, one of the initiatives that we pursued has been uh, combined patrolling uh, that, uh, that uh, is designed to basically patrol on both sides of the border in, in close cooperation with each other. So we're covering both, uh, both aspects of, uh, of uh, 
personnel entering and, and exiting the border area. And that seems to be working quite well. Uh, really, since, uh, since January, we've seen, I think, a decrease in the amount of, uh, of incidents that we've had along the border. And I, I really attribute that to the, to the very close tactical cooperation and communication uh, that we're able to achieve with the Pakistan military in the border area. <coughs> Uh, Greg Jaffe, uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, there was a lot of concern earlier this year about a spike in attacks and a spring offensive. Have you guys seen an uh, uh, increase in attacks over the course of the spring? And I know that you guys plussed up the number of troops you've got in your uh, area uh, to deal with that. Um, how much longer do you guys see you needing to maintain this higher level of troops? Well, uh, we hope that we hope that the increase in troops will uh, will be an enduring requirement here in Afghanistan, and we certainly think that has helped uh, to make a difference here. It's uh, it's certainly given us the flexibility uh, to position forces uh, at uh, at uh, broader areas across our specific area of operations, and given us not only the ability to uh, position along the border, but more importantly, the ability to operate in the interior. Which is, which is where the people are and where, where uh, there are also threats. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that we're going to continue to maintain that for some time until we accomplish the mission. As, as you're probably aware, the 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division, uh, who was extended to create that, uh, that 2nd Brigade the first time around, is, is due to rotate here uh, in the next 45 days, and, and we will be uh, bringing in a brigade from, uh, from Italy to, to, uh, to replace them. So we're, we're very glad, uh, glad to, be, uh, uh, to be doing that. With respect to uh, the first part of your question, the spring offensive, uh, I'm not sure I would classify it as an offensive. But we, we have been more offensive than, uh, than I think they have in, in our posturing and in our ability to dominate uh, uh, areas on, on the battlefield. And so as a result of that, I think we've, uh, we've seen a decrease in, in, uh, in, uh, in activities along the border uh, and our ability to be in more places along with our Afghan National Security Force partners uh, has, has, has enabled us to, to address a, a broader, uh, broader area across Regional Command East. Um, so I, I would not necessarily characterize it uh, as any kind of offense. We certainly haven't seen it uh, you know, manifest itself to any great degree. Uh, that, of course, is not to say there haven't been attacks. There have. Uh, we continue to be probed uh, on a regular basis. We continue to see attacks in the interior. Uh, but uh, we have not seen what I would describe as a spring offensive by the, uh, by the Taliban. So this is Jim Guerrero with American Forces Press Service. Uh, the Army, of course, recently extended tours to 15 months in Afghanistan. What are you hearing from your paratroopers about that? What are, the, what are they saying to you? Well, uh, well, you know, soldiers are soldiers are soldiers, and uh, no, nobody wants to nobody wants to stay any longer than uh, than they're required to to stay here in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, that said, you know, we are relatively early on in our our deployment here. Uh, it was not unexpected completely that we might be uh, we might be extended. We certainly uh, have seen that occur uh, uh, with the third brigade that was here, uh, and we've we've seen it occur in other locations. So it's it's not a phenomenon that was completely unexpected. Uh, with that, I think in talking to most soldiers out there, uh, and, and I and I do have a have a pretty good opportunity to get around and visit with them and talk to them. Uh, they are glad to be here, participating in this mission. Uh, they believe in it. Uh, and uh, I think they're committed to, to stay and uh, accomplish the mission, uh, and we will trust that our leaders uh, will be taking care of our families and, and get us back as, as, uh, as soon as, uh, soon as we can uh, and when we've, when we've completed our portion of the mission. General, it's Nick Simeone at Fox. Uh, General Pace, of course, mentioned that um, weapons made in Iran have been found in Afghanistan. What to you does this say about Iran's intentions in Afghanistan, and do you see um, Iran uh, trying to behave similar to the way they're accused of behaving in Iraq? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I really have the visibility to, uh, to address that particular, uh, that particular problem, that particular issue there. Uh, being in uh, Regional Command East, uh, you know, our focus is more over on the Pakistan border, so we certainly don't see anything direct 
uh, uh, influence uh, from Iran. Uh, and, and, I, and, and I think the situation in Afghanistan is a little bit different than it probably is in, uh, in, in Iraq. We don't really have a very good, uh, a, a very good uh, feel for what those influences might be right now. Uh, and as uh, General Pace said, uh, I think it's relatively, uh, it's relatively unknown at this time what, what those exact uh, uh, linkages are back to Iran, Iran, other than the fact that maybe some Iranian materials have been found in, in Afghanistan. Uh, right now, it's not having an impact uh, here in Regional Command East. Sir, it's Pam Hassigan uh, with UPI. Could you um, talk to us about the incident in Jalalabad um, with the Marine Special Operations Force? I think that's in your AO. What measures have you taken since they were pulled out? How are you all keeping security there? Um, have you compensated uh, the apparent victims of this? And uh, what are you doing to uh, prevent something like this from happening again? Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, certainly that incident remains, as, as you're well aware, remains under, uh, under investigation, so I, I won't talk about any specifics with that. Um, you know, I think it's important to recognize that uh, that, that incident started with, an ins with, uh, with a terrorist attack on a Marine convoy that was conducted in the very close proximity of a, uh, of a civilian marketplace. Uh, and, uh, and so, by, by virtue of doing that, that attack, they, the insurgents, the terrorists, exposed, uh, exposed not only our Marines but, uh, but civilians to, to harm as well. What we have done with that is uh, we, through our provincial reconstruction teams, uh, we have a very good relationship with the governor of Nangahar province. Uh, we were very quick to get out and link up with him and get out and talk with the uh, tribal elders and uh, other government officials that operate in that area. Uh, we worked very closely with them to identify the victims and the, fam and the families of these victims and arrange for, uh, for compensation. And, and uh, that has taken place and it continues to take place uh, even as, as we speak. Um, certainly these types of incidents always cause us to go back and look at our procedures and so we have done that as well. Uh, and uh, w what we have done specifically is look at, uh, at uh, how units respond when they're in close proximity to, uh, to civilian areas uh, and we try to emphasize the various escalation of force measures that, uh, that are approved for use here in, uh, in Regional Command East. Uh, and uh, and uh, tried to emphasize those those techniques, and, and we've essentially done some retraining throughout our entire force to make sure that everyone is is fully aware of that. We obviously uh, regret the loss of any life, uh, and we're we're committed to protecting the uh, the Afghan people. This is Kristen Roberts with Reuters. Um, we've seen, I believe, yesterday some coordinated attacks on police posts and a government headquarters just northeast of Kabul, um, which led the provincial government to call in U.S. military reinforcements. I'm hoping you can give us some additional details about those attacks by the Taliban and, let, and tell us what is your thinking on how far the provincial government is from being able to protect its own police posts without U.S. Um, assistance? Well, with those uh, with those uh, attacks yesterday, uh, 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 those occurred in uh, uh, in an area just I think actually to the uh, to the east of us here, uh, and in that case, uh, the uh, the local local authorities felt like they were under some threat. Uh, obviously, I think it demonstrates a close relationship that they have with both uh, with both the the uh, coalition forces we have here and with the uh, Afghan national security forces. And so we quickly responded to that. Uh, we were very uh, we were cap able to get uh, some close air support on to station very quickly uh, and uh, get our get some of our forces as well as Afghan national security forces down into the area as quickly as we can. Um, and uh, to secure the situation. So uh, that, that, uh, that is not something that we're unac unac unaccustomed to doing, um, and, uh, and it's, it's just the nature of, of, of business uh, here that, uh, that we're dealing with. 
with with respect to the the other part of your question there relating to the provincial government um, w this is an area that we watch very very closely and through our provision our pro provincial reconstruction teams uh, I think we have a very good handle on where we are with the development of our uh, provincial governments here in in regional command east I think we are uh, we are uh, very happy to have some very good governors throughout our our, uh, our regional command here who are very actively involved uh, with the people uh, who are, have no problem getting out and meeting with them and who maintain excellent relationships uh, not only with uh, our forces but more importantly with uh, with the Afghan National Security Forces out there so I think we're making real progress in this direction I will tell you that our number one priority for development here is to ensure that we have our provincial coordination centers and our district coordination centers up and operating uh, and that means that we have facilities uh, that, that that are built and and capable to handle the these uh, these uh, representatives from the from the security forces uh, that we have the communications in place that we have the procedures in place and more importantly that we are starting to build the trust uh, in the uh, in the people uh, that they can go to their provincial coordination center they can, they can contact their district uh, centers and and get uh, help I had an opportunity last week to go out and visit the Provincial Coordination Center out in Coast Province, out in uh, the extreme eastern part of our area, and uh, I will tell you, it was it was uh, it was very refreshing to see the cooperation, the coordination that was taking place uh, in that uh, Provincial Coordination Center. Very good communications, very good cooperation, represent representation by all the elements of the uh, Afghan National Security Forces, Army, Police, uh, Border Police as well as the coalition forces. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction with that. The follow up there, I mean, we've just heard you say that the increased forces you've received you hope will be maintained. I'm just trying to get an idea of, of the time frame here on this. How long do you expect you're going to need to provide protection to the provincial governments or in other words, when are they going to be stood up and in a position to not need to call in U.S. military reinforcement when the Taliban attacks? Well, uh, if I, let, me, let me just clarify for a second. At the, at the example that I just cited to you out in Coast Province, the security for that provincial, uh, uh, provincial coordination center for two other district centers that, uh, that I visited that same day was not being provided by, coal, by coalition forces, but it was being provided by Afghan national security forces. So in, in many cases, they have taken on responsibility for, uh, for doing this. Uh, the Afghan army is, uh, you know, is approximately uh, uh, 30,000 30, strong, growing to about 70,000. The Afghan uh, uh, police, uh, national police, are about 55 to 60,000 strong, growing to about 82,000. So there's still growth that has to occur in, the, in, that partic in those particular forces, but they are, they are, they are definitely moving in, in the right direction. Uh, with respect to the timeline, uh, I'm not sure I could, I could tell you that. I, th I think we will continue to provide uh, the levels of, of uh, forces here and, and assistance uh, as long as the, uh, as the uh, Islamic Republic of uh, Afghan's government wants us to be here and as long as it's required um, as I mentioned to you we're gonna we're gonna replace the the second brigade here uh, very shortly and maintain that uh, that level of force uh, I think it's making a big difference right now and it's helping uh, to create the conditions where uh, the Afghan national security forces and the government can really start developing some capacity and extending their reach and influence beyond Kabul and the provincial uh, uh, capitals out into the out into the villages uh, where the people uh, live and work. Time for maybe one more, Courtney. Hi, uh, this is Courtney <coughs> QB with NBC News. I just want to get a little bit more information about the the Marines that uh, were involved in the um, the civilians who were killed several weeks ago. Can you just give us an uh, a, an idea of number one, the final answer on how many civilians were killed and how many were wounded, um, and also by the U.S. military providing payments to the families of those killed, is that an admission that they were killed, that they were innocents that were killed? And then uh, finally, if you can give us an idea of, of why it was that the Marines left Afghanistan.
Okay. Um, I think you might have. I think you might have dropped. You might have. I think you might have dropped off there. But I. But I think I have the gist of your question. I think you were interested in me providing a little more information on uh, on the unit that was involved in that uh, incident uh, up in uh, Nangahar Province, uh, and then uh, a little bit more detail on the number of uh, of uh, civilian casualties that may have taken taken uh, place or may have occurred. Is, is that correct? And then also if you could tell us why it was that the Marines left Afghanistan so early into their tour. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, well, let me, uh, let me just uh, say this. I, I think the, uh, the, uh, the numbers, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, there is an investigation ongoing. Uh, we know that there was somewhere between 8 and 12 uh, civilians who were killed in that incident uh, and probably somewhere between... Uh, uh, I think uh, 20 to 25 that were injured. I don't know the exact uh, the exact numbers because that investigation is actually being conducted outside of this headquarters. But those are the approximate initial reports that uh, that we had. Um, uh, so that uh, that's what uh, that's what that's what I think that it was. The uh, the unit that was here was uh, uh, a, a company that uh, from the Marine Corps that was uh, operating as part of. Uh, the special operations forces here, uh, and uh, I think as uh, as uh, that command said in their press release regarding this, that uh, this incident uh, had really uh, uh, created conditions here that would have made it very very difficult for that unit to continue to operate in this area, and so the decision was made to to withdraw them. Uh, I think any more specific questions in that particular area uh, would really need to be uh, directed to the command who is who is doing the investigation. Uh, and who actually made that decision. That met with the local tribal leaders. Who from the U.S. military? I, I'm sorry, you're a little bit broken there. I, I caught the local tribal leaders. Who from the U.S. military met with the tribal leaders to discuss all this after the incident? Well, uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, we use we use our provincial reconstruction teams to help uh, help do this. Um, what in this case, it, it's not necessarily the U.S. military that uh, is out there addressing their uh, their their concerns. Although we our our, our provincial reconstruction team commander uh, and the uh, and the brigade commander who operates in that area were out there and available and, and actually met. But uh, for the most part, most of this was handled by by the governor, the provincial governor, and other leadership uh, there. They, they, we could, were quickly in, in contact with them. They were quickly involved with the tribal leaders, uh, went down and conducted a series of meetings or shuras uh, with them to discuss the incident and, uh, and make sure that uh, uh, they understood what, uh, what occurred in, uh, uh, from, uh, from their perspective. Uh, and, then, and we've continued to use that mechanism to, uh, to uh, work uh, the salacia payments uh, to, the, to the families of those who were uh, killed or wounded. One last question. You mentioned several times a decrease in attacks um, or incidents uh, and that you attributed to the work that you guys are doing. Would you put numbers on that, please? Um, yeah, the numbers. Um, well, I, th I think I'm not sure I would tell you that uh, there's any any particular number here in here in Afghanistan. Uh, it, it ebbs and flows uh, a little bit over time. Uh, for example, as we look at suicide IED attacks, we we've seen a we saw a little spike in the uh, in the uh, in the fall here. Uh, we've seen some here this uh, this spring, uh, but in general, the numbers uh, are, are are trending in the downward fashion. Uh, with respect to those type of attacks. Uh, we were uh, having relatively f uh, frequent contact uh, along the border, uh, probably uh, uh, three to four times a week uh, with, uh, with attempts uh, to, uh, to make contact with our forces. Uh, we've seen that drop off uh, probably to about half of that on a, on a regular basis. So uh, that's, that's probably how I would, uh, I would try to quantify that. Okay, sir, we have come to the end of our time. We appreciate uh, you being with us today, and we'd like to turn it back to you for any closing comments. Okay, well, thank you. I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate all of your questions today and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to address you. 
I, I just like to say thank you to all those who are continuing to support our mission here. We're very uh, grateful for the support that we get from the people of the United States as well as the international community, uh, our NATO partners and the other coalition uh, countries who contribute uh, forces and resources uh, here for the future of Afghanistan. The Afghanistan National Security Forces also deserve an enormous amount of credit for the valor and patriotism that they bring to this mission. Uh, I feel privileged to serve uh, alongside them, as do our own soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And I will just tell you that our troops, all of them here in Afghanistan, are doing a tremendous job, uh, not only for Afghanistan, but uh, for the United States and, and the world. And they truly deserve our respect and admiration. Uh, their dedication and devotion to duty is extraordinary, and every American should be very proud that our sons and daughters are doing this uh, noble work here in, uh, in Afghanistan. I firmly believe we are making steady progress here in Afghanistan, and we're going to continue to do so. There is a lot of work to do uh, here, uh, but we are unda undaunted. And together with our NATO and coalition partners and with the support of the international community and the Afghan people, uh, we're going to overcome the devastation that this country has endured for 25 or 30 years of war. Uh, we will overcome all these challenges and, and, and uh, bring peace and stability and development for the future of Afghanistan. Thank you all for your time today and uh, for your continued support. Thank you again, sir. We hope to see you again down the road. Thank you very much.